Morning, everybody. Thank you for coming out at like 9.30 in the morning in Vegas, either very early for some people, very late for others, um, and especially to uh, hear a talk about, you know, mathy stuff like operations. So, you know, again, I'll see if I can slip anything about push dose pressors or airway management into this, but my hope is that this talk is uh, actually pretty accessible to a lot of folks. All right, and with that, we're going to get started. So this is titled, How Many Doctors Does It Take to Clear the Waiting Room? Queuing Theory Applications for Emergency Medicine Operations. Now, queuing is a very deep topic. We're going to spend about 15 to 20 minutes talking about it, so we're not going to leave this room with a perfect understanding of queuing theory. But the important thing is that there are a lot of lessons that are still very useful, um, no matter where you are in administration or quality assurance. My disclosures. I have funding from the following organizations. If you at some point perceive that there is some contribution from big ethics or from patient safety, good. Um, so fundamentally, cues, or as people on this side of the Atlantic call them, lines, are fundamentally about waiting. Our patients do it all the time. We're waiting for results all the time. Ultimately, it's a source of frustration at a minimum and often an issue of safety as well. Now again, I mentioned that this is kind of a mathy topic. Um, now again, one of the things was that around the turn of the 20th century, a number of scientists recognized that there were common equations that govern the behavior of many different processes in very diverse fields. So it could be telephony, could be making donuts, or it could be coordinating airlines. All of these have fundamental relationships based on how lines form and how delays build up, and ultimately, a lot of the times, it really doesn't matter what exactly you're delivering and how you're delivering it. All of these are fairly complex processes. Again, hooking up a switchboard or making a donut, there's a varied number of steps. Getting an airline from Chicago to Dallas, that's a very complex process. There are a lot of interlocking parts, not just in the aircraft alone. And ultimately, a lot of the time, we're just taking this very superficial view of these processes when there's a lot more going on. But often, the end results are the ones that we care about that really are visible. The most important thing, and again, believe me, there's not going to be really any math there, is that queuing theory gives us a number of really simple tools that we can use to simplify. A lot of what queuing theory means to me um, in helping management to decide how many doctors we need in the morning, how many people we need on one shift, is actually about clearing away misconceptions about how work gets done. Now again, if we look at all three of these things, different costs, different processes, fundamentally, they're all considered discrete processes. Now again, even though they're a complex combination of steps, as um, TDC Little uh, originally stated, basically, even though these are separate and distinct processes, we can break them down into individual parts. You can't really give somebody half of a donut. Creating a donut is fundamentally a process. It may have a lot of steps, but you have a step, it contributes, and you get an end result. Similarly, with an airline flight, you really don't want to deliver your customer half of an airline flight. That's a really big problem. So again, what I like to break this down to is something that may have simple steps, but we can see the beginning and end and look at it as a unit. I like triage in particular because most of us understand that you know, patient workups can be pretty variable, but depending on how your shop functions, triage tends to be a very straightforward process. Again, some steps may vary a little bit on your, based on your institution, but fundamentally it is a discrete process. Step one, you generally find out who the patient is, get a name, get an age, find out why they're here, get a chief complaint, you briefly examine them and take vital signs, and at the end of it, you give them a priority. I'll say for the sake of argument, depends how your emergency department functions, if you've got registration as part of triage, depending on if you're drawing labs during triage, but fundamentally, let's say for the sake of argument, it takes about six minutes to triage a patient. Of course, there are going to be exceptions. Some people's disposition is really straightforward when they walk in the door. But for example, let's say you have an emergency department that takes, on average, 10 patients per hour. Again. I'm going to keep it light with the math. And I'm telling you, just for the sake of argument, these aren't averages. It's not like some hours you're going to get seven, some hours you're going to get eight. Fundamentally, I'm going to tell you, you get six patients every hour, 
just 10 patients per hour coming every six minutes. So based on the fact that it takes six minutes to triage a patient, you get 10 patients per hour, how many nurses do you need at this point to avoid a wait? The answer seems pretty straightforward. 60 minutes in an hour, 10 patients come every hour, six minutes per patient leads us to one nurse at triage. This makes sense. General nod of assent, hopefully. My math more or less checks out. So this works in exactly one scenario, and that's when patients show up at perfect regular intervals, very neatly spaced, but it leads to a lot of problems if you actually try to apply this sort of thinking in the real world. Patients arrive at irregular intervals. Again, unless you have people who are going through an appointment scheduling software, um, fundamentally, nobody coordinates when they decide to come in. Now, there are some exceptions to this in that you, know, you have a major trauma, you're gonna get maybe two patients at once, but for the sake of argumentation, most of the way that people who do queuing theory as a rigorous science look at it, there's gonna be some meaningful separation. It might be a 20 second separation between two patients, but you generally don't get two patients in the exact same instant. And the problem with this is that while these patients are moving back and forth, even though you might be getting a perfect average every hour of six patients on the hour, the times when you are not actively working up a patient, you're wasting time. There's no way to get that time back. And fundamentally, if two patients arrive in quick succession and you only have one person who can see them within that small period of time, a wait is going to happen. Again, it doesn't matter how fast you can turn people around, even if it only takes you one minute to triage somebody. Fundamentally, if somebody arrives at 30 seconds into that first person's wait workup, they're gonna have to wait at least a little while. And again, this does not average out. Like, if you can remember one thing from this talk, it's that averages tend to lie. So again, looking at this relationship, because you can't stockpile capacity, you have to really imagine that these are gonna be very well distributed intervals. Now, there was a, another French math type named Poisson um, who determined that for many of these processes, inter-arrival times are governed by what's known as an exponential distribution. So the likelihood of having two people in quick succession tends to go down fairly rapidly and evenly spaced arrivals are an exceedingly rare occurrence. So how long fundamentally does it take to be seen? Another scientist, Erlang, did a lot of very uh, important work in terms of telephone connectivity, looking at it as the same sort of process that triage might be, broke this down into a metric called utilization. And it's looking at the amount of time it takes to provide a service to somebody on average versus how long on average that arrival time is gonna be. And basically, things get very hairy after a certain point. When you're not well compensated, there is a magic number, and that's 80% of utilization. So once you hit 80% in terms of utilization, weights tend to multiply way out of control. And that's fundamentally because of that difference in interval arrival time. So again, that's kind of the fudge factor that's built into a lot of systems unknowingly. And the more variable things become, the more problems happen with utilization. So again, six, patients every, or patients every six minutes, 10 patients per hour would be great. All of us know that even on a great day, we never really get that average number of patients every single hour. There's some hours where we get way more than we're expecting, other hours where it's just a little bit too quiet in our ID. And the problem with this is that as variation grows, as things become less smooth, utilization becomes even more problematic. So again, that magic number of 80% if you have twice the degree of variability, it's actually gonna be a lot closer to a magic number of like 50%. So fundamentally, you can change this relationship by increasing the number of providers that you have. If it's triage, putting more nurses forward, and that tends to cause the curve to flatten out quite a bit. So what conclusions can we draw from this? Well, fundamentally, I can tell you that the no wait emergency department that so many administrators and hospital administration tend to promote as our goal does not exist, period. Much like the great kazoo, it's a figment of their imaginations that only they can see. So going back to this curve, what we're trying to guarantee is something a little bit more rudimentary. We can't guarantee that our patients are not gonna wait, but we, what we can guarantee 
is a level of service, we can set a reasonable aim that patients may not necessarily be likely to wait an hour or longer most of the time. Again, we can't guarantee nobody is going to wait an hour, uh, again, unless you can pull a backbench of an unlimited number of nurses or doctors. But we can pretty reasonably say that 90% of the time, that 95% of the time, based on the number of people that we actually have at triage, based on how long an average turnaround time takes, we can get that number down to a very infrequent one. You can calculate this using a number of different calculators, some of which are available online, but just to warn you that the results for certain levels of service may not be fun to contemplate. And again, we actually have to ask ourselves very hard questions about what are acceptable and unacceptable weights. Um, now to actually look at how we do our job as docs, taking care of one patient, like I said before with the airline, with the donut, even with making a cup of coffee if you're at Starbucks, is actually dependent on a lot of these different processes working together. So again, to look at any one part of these things, any one of these can be seen as a cue in and of itself. You can use the same equations, the same calculators to look at how a resident may see a patient and then wait for an available attending to present to, or to how long it's going to take lab results to come back. Again, these processes can get really complicated, and sometimes just one calculator might not seem like it could be enough. So we make a lot of simplifying assumptions, even for these pretty complex processes. For a lot of us who actually do um, queuing theory as part of our job, fundamentally, we'll take one process, break it down using a calculator, but what we'll do is actually not that far away from your equivalent of like SimCity in your ED. We tend to run many, many, many mathematical simulations of an ED on different days to see what making one of these adjustments will do. But fundamentally, we use the same calculators that you might look at for that one process to do it. Again, we make a lot of simplifying assumptions. So one of the things that you really have to think about is that actually people, as individuals, act with their own internal cues. And this gets really into the heart of physician management and why some of those assumptions about productivity actually are just as flawed. So if you think about how you work up a patient, we all take a history, or we all pride ourselves on our physical exam. Usually you order some labs, or you order some medications, and you wait for a response. You try and see what happens. Either the patient feels better after the medication, the x-ray shows a fracture, and fundamentally that helps you make your decision, and you make a disposition. Our job whether we like it or not, consists of repeating this process over and over and over again. And a lot of times people talk about how we as emergency physicians multitask. That's how we get things done really quickly. But fundamentally, the way that we multitask does not work like this. As somebody who is asking me about how emergency physicians can possibly multitask asked, how is it possible that you were able to treat two patients at once? Do you place an IV in one hand and listen with your stethoscope using the other? No, fundamentally what we do is we switch between tasks. So you all know that basically the way a lot of times when we're seeing many patients this breaks down, most of our job happens at the two ends of the spectrum. We spend an inordinate amount of time waiting for stuff to come back, waiting for the medication to be given, waiting for a response, waiting for lab, waiting for x-ray, waiting for somebody to read our CT scan. Once you've gone through that process, usually you've already thought about what your plan for disposition is, and it's more a matter of either having that conversation with a patient or, more realistically, a lot of the time, hitting a button. Work is being done up front and a little bit at the end. So we engage in a process called pipelining. And so basically we stack up one workup and another and another, and they keep going until we face an interruption. At some point, there's a lab result we have to deal with, the patient maybe has an adverse reaction to one of the medications we gave. Um, one of the nurses says, I really want you to discharge this patient. Something keeps us from moving ahead like a shark. So in a number of papers, we looked at this initially at how residents function and then later at a group of community hospitals. And the current paradigm, again, where I'm talking about real averages here, is a bit of a lie. I don't know a resident that I've ever worked with who has managed to get two or 2.5 patients per hour every single hour of their shift. It's a really good paradigm for how robots work. 
Fundamentally, residents and attendings just the same work very differently. We tend to come in like gangbusters on hour one of our shift if there are patients to see. We tend to maybe overtax ourselves a little bit and then around hour four or hour five, once we've managed to get a couple of dispos, a lot of us get a second wind and we kind of keep going in anticipation of when the next team is coming. And if you look at the queue of active patients building, a lot of time we build up that head of steam, our queue fills up, and then we reach a steady state. We can only take care of new patients at the rate that we actually get patients out the door or can get lab results back. And so usually, if we have some staggered shifts, by the time that second team arrives, we're able to lighten our load a little bit, potentially pick up a few more patients. But fundamentally, by the time our relief is in sight, by the time somebody is coming to take over for us, we're usually just cleaning up shop. Most people, an hour before their shift ends, unless you make them, are not going to willingly see those additional patients. So the reality in the current paradigm may average out. Again, you might technically see an average of two patients per hour, but if you make the assumption that that's the actual number of patients you're going to see every hour, you're going to end up with some significant weights for those patients who end up at the end of your shift. So looking at the hospital I work at, BI, we had a major problem where wait times before noon, and especially in the late evening, were getting way out of control. So again, Variability is baked into our schedules. This was kind of a typical day's worth of waiting. And looking at the early afternoon, we understood that we couldn't really change the number of docs that we had working. We have a limited number of residents. We have a more adjustable number of attendings. Um, but fundamentally, you can't change that number, and you can't really blow up the schedule. Putting everybody on like a four-hour shift at the beginning of the day and a two-hour shift for a few hours would be awesome. Um, but for humanitarian reasons and maybe pesky regulatory reasons, we can't really do that. Um, so our residency leadership came up with this really great idea that we were going to beat the peak. Uh, basically, this was, we're just going to have everybody at the end of their shift pick up more patients so we get rid of the peak. How do you guys think that worked out for us? Not too great. So we had these overlapping shifts. We had two fundamental teams taking care of kind of the, the majority of patients coming into our general care area. And this was pretty much how things were staggered. Each one of these is a, a discrete shift. And productivity numbers looked more or less like this. People would start strong and taper off. And so looking at how this matches up with our weights, basically this was how we predicted based on the number of people we had on the teams productivity should be working. Again, we're going to make the assumption that everybody comes in like gangbusters at the beginning of the shift. This is what should happen. But you can see, kind of as this lines up, around 2 o'clock, around 8 o'clock, there are just huge gaps where not a lot is getting done. So fundamentally, what ends up happening is that when you look at how close those two initial peaks are for the overlapping shifts, that capacity gets wasted. Team 1 comes in, they see a ton of patients initially. Team 2 comes in, they're twiddling their thumbs for two or three hours. So this is what productivity actually looked like for those additional teams. Wasn't for lack of trying, just was for lack of patience initially. So we made the smallest possible intervention. Again, we didn't want to disrupt schedules. We didn't want to put tons of extra people on nights. So we moved stuff over by an hour. And these productivity curves actually stayed the way that we predicted that they should have been. The mean time for patients in the waiting room went down from 55 minutes to 46, and our median had a pretty big change as well. So I know I said there wasn't going to be a lot of math, and I don't want you to have to do any major math. So if you go on your phone, on your computer, to edq.org, you're going to find two very easy to use models for how averages might seem they should work out in theory and how an actual queuing theory approach would look. Again, it's about kind of guaranteeing that level of service, and again, it may surprise you that at a certain number of patients per hour to really guarantee that the weight doesn't get out of hand, you might need a lot more docs than you might expect. Um, so you can play around with these calculators. We're going to be adding several more over the course of the coming months, and probably by midsummer. So we're going to actually have one of those simulation models so you can actually run the kind of SimCity version of your ED and see what happens. So again, some take home points. Understand that weights are going to happen. Take a deep breath, deep cleansing breath, and come to peace with the fact that weights are going to happen.
remember that there is that magic number. When you hit 80% capacity and exceed it, weights are going to explode. So if you can keep things at 80%, you've built yourself a very comfortable buffer. And finally, if you can't add more service, if you can't get more doctors to work on shift, at least see on a granular level where the delays tend to happen during the day and try to shift doctors to before those delays happen, just by a little bit. I think we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, one of the issues that we seem to find at our um, emergency department is people come on to some of their shifts, but there are no patients for them to see because we're bed blocked. And we've tried to make adjustments so that we would kind of do what you did, spread out when people are arriving, but it still results in people showing up and only seeing one or two patients in their first hour, but the previous providers are really overwhelmed with high patient volumes and it's slowing down their ability to dispo their patients and open up rooms. Did you look at that and do you have anything that you've gleaned from your uh, work that would be applicable to improving that? Yeah, um, and I, I think you've kind of hit the nail on the head in terms of what a lot of the challenges that are out of our hands uh, really are about. Um, I can tell you from our experience, one of the biggest things is actually going to um, the internal medicine service, going to a lot of the people we're most dependent for on beds, and actually trying to see if we can adjust some of the culture there about when people are actually discharged. So again, a lot of the times we get kind of a bimodal distribution. You get a couple of people who are rearing to go at seven o'clock, they're either being discharged formally or they're being sent to rehab, and then there's kind of a pause as rounds happen on the wards, and then several hours later, it's time to think about dispos again. And again, we'd get a pretty similar phenomenon. Early in the morning, we'd have maybe a couple patients to see, they'd get relatively quick dispos, and there's this uncomfortable middle where just we are totally stuck. Um, and while I would love to say you should sit your administrators down upstairs and have them do a little queuing theory to see when delays are going to build up. Oftentimes, it, it really is a matter of having that kind of conversation and saying, look, it may be that we need another case manager who's going to be working during rounds. It may not be an ED issue, but we have to be able to smooth out when these blocks are happening. So again, I wish I had the magic queuing bullet to solve both of those problems, both the physician staffing problem and the bed problem at once. But usually, if your issue is not that you have, you know, three docs who are twiddling their thumbs at that hour, but you have one or two, um, then often that bad issue is going to be the, the central one to focus on. Good morning. Thanks for a nice talk. I'm Kevin Ferguson from Fresno, California. In our shop, we've had a vigorous debate um, about the, batch, the batching type doctors and the C1. Go, some of us, some of the docs would click on five patients and then go see them in. That, that batch and then come back and get three or four more. And I was more like click on one, go see the patient, put the orders in, click on another one. Is there any difference as far as those two different styles that would affect the queuing theory and the patient weights? Absolutely. Um, so there's a version of this talk that I give to residents, which is basically how not to behave as a resident when you have ad libitum patients to see. And so, you know, I think to take things along the best faith that I can with most of our residents, they come into their shift, they are excited to see people. And I think we all tend to overestimate how fast we move. And I will say, because our residents are usually pretty good at picking from the top of the list, if they see a really interesting chief complaint or like a patient that they know is gonna have like a dislocation or like some cool procedure to do, rather than trying to cherry pick, which they'll get called on, they'll just like pick up three patients in a row, the third of which is the dislocation that they want to do. The problem with this is that if your patients are, say, like medium sick, they're not so sick that they have to be brought back immediately and they just need an immediate resuscitation, but let's say patient number one in the queue 
is, you know, a belly pain who has great vital signs. Patient two is maybe grandma who maybe has a little fever, probably has pneumonia, probably could actually benefit from some of those early interventions. And patient three is the dislocation patient. What's basically happened is that first resident who just took the first three patients, when they go to see the patients in order, grandma who really could use that fairly immediate attention of another resident is actually now patient number two in that first resident's queue, whereas some other resident who's fresh and could be seeing that patient at the same time is now blocked because this person has just tried to batch everything at once. Um, so fundamentally, the most efficient behavior you can promote among your docs, among your residents, is to just click, go see the patient, come back immediately. Um, and fundamentally, you know, we, there are residents where we have them, they pick up five patients within the first three minutes of being there. On my best day as a resident, I can tell you I never saw five patients within the span of 10 minutes. This is a little bit different either, one, if you are single coverage or you're, say, dual coverage and you know your partner is going to be doing a procedure. In that case, batching may be totally appropriate. And alternatively, if you have a system where one doc is not necessarily responsible for the totality of a patient's care, either you have a doc in triage or you have a more flexible model uh, where, you know, patients are occasionally handed off mid-shift, then batching patients may be totally appropriate if you can get those workups started first. But it's, I think, those are the exceptions rather than the rule. Hello, that was a great talk. Um, sometimes where I work, uh, there will be a lot of physicians ready to see patients and lots of patients ready to be seen. Um, but the nurses are like overwhelmed by all the orders that the physicians have given. And I've wondered if you've looked at like the same kind of product productivity curves for the nurses and if they have the same shape as physicians or if they're a different shape and like how you can match that to the physician's productivity curve so everyone's being productive at the same time. Great question. So again, yeah, part of this is always what pieces of this do we actually have control over? Um, I think one of the biggest kind of issues, both blessing and curse, that we've seen with nurses at our institution and some of the community sites we manage is that if you look at that physician curve where it's just like come in like gangbusters and then completely crater shortly afterward, nurses are a lot better about not trying to take on too much at once. Again, you come into the beginning of the, your shift after sign out, you may have a fair number of things to clean up, but usually people are pretty mellow. And again, sometimes the incentives play in a lot. If you're in a profit and loss system with physicians, people tend to come in as strong as they can, whereas if you are compensated hourly and there's not necessarily any measure where the number of patients you take care of is tied into any incentives, people have a very good tendency to kind of smooth out and mellow out. And so for a lot of our nurses, you know, they know how many patients they can safely handle at once, and they generally don't really move too far beyond that unless somebody is really sick and needs them to jump in. Um, so in a sense, they tend to do a very good job of kind of self-regulating and not overburdening, them, or overburdening themselves at once. Uh, but again, trying to change those behaviors can also be really tough. Um, and it can be a really uncomfortable conversation with nursing management if you suddenly say, hey, I know that everybody is very happy with having you know, two shifts, seven to seven and seven to seven, in order to better manage patients, keep people moving, can we talk about breaking some of those shifts down, turning them into three shifts? And again, that ends up being a problem because a lot of the ideal shifts we'd like to make end up conflicting with a lot of social, social facts. Um, so again, sometimes those are issues we can fix, sometimes they're not. If there are any more questions, uh, feel, free, feel free to email me or just visit the website, and uh, good luck.